Good morning and welcome to South Point Church Online. My name's Matt. I'm part of the team here at South Point. We want to welcome all of our guests today. We especially want to welcome our local guests from St. Mary's in Calvert County. We're so glad that you're with us. We also want to welcome those of you from different parts of the country that may be watching online. And we're just really glad that you chose to join us today. We're actually launching a brand new series today called Anxious for Nothing. And by the way, we actually do prepare our sermons in advance. And so the timing is actually pretty cool. You probably already know this, but anxiety and worry are exploding here in the U.S. I don't know if you know this, but mental health or anxiety is the number one mental health issue here in America. Did you know that one out of five Americans, that's over 40 million Americans, deal with clinical anxiety. Did you also know that one out of every two Americans will experience a mental health issue at least once in their lifetime? And if you think the statistics for adults are shocking, the statistics for teens, man, that is scary. It's so scary, it's actually terrifying. Matter of fact, the Pew Research did some research on teens and asked them what they thought their greatest problem was. We're going to take a look at that infograph. Teen Problems Among Peers, the Pew Research Center from September, November of 2018, and they say, Listen, 70% anxiety and depression. I mean, that is an amazing fact. And so whenever we talk about anxiety and depression, we have to realize that no matter the amount of adults that have anxiety and the amount of teens that have anxiety, did you know that less than 50% of people who struggle with anxiety and depression actually go get help. And so when we talk about anxiety, we need to make sure that we define what anxiety is and how it's different than worry. And so we're going to put up the slide hip here on the screen. It says, listen, fear sees a threat and then reacts. Like, have you ever been walking around and then see a spider and went, oh my gosh, a spider, and then run? Because that's what I do. I heard one comedian talking about fear and they said, I don't know why people fear spiders. Diarrhea kills more people annually than spiders. And so listen, anxiety imagines a threat and can't move. Imagines a threat and can't move. See, anxiety is when the flood of what ifs come in. I bet this has happened to you. I know it's happened to me. Maybe you are at work and the flood and tidal wave of what ifs come in and you begin to think, what if this? And then what if that? And what if that happens? It leads to this. And then five minutes later, you're staring at the screen and someone says, what are you thinking about? And you're like, I, I don't know. Maybe it was because you were tossing or turning in your bed and you were going through all the what ifs if this happens and this happens and you can't get any sleep. And it leaves us asking, why in America are we the most anxious country in the world? What is leading to this? Maybe you've heard this, but social scientists have discovered and discovered this fact is that as Americans, we are less relationally connected than at any other time in the history of the United States. And not only are we less connected relationally, we're actually more plugged in digitally um, through the internet and through our cell phones, uh, consuming massive amounts of digital information. And it leads to this thing I'm going to put up on the screen that says this, being underconnected relationally and overconnected digitally can lead to a distorted view. And here's how we end up with a distorted view. When we're not relationally connected as much as we should be, we feel isolated. And then when we feel isolated, we consume social media. Think of Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook, maybe even Netflix and Hulu. I mean, those are actors. And on Facebook and Instagram, we always put our best foot forward. We only show the highlight reel. And so the comparison starts to build and build and everyone's life looks way better than ours. And not only are we able to access everyone's highlights, tragedies that happen on different continents at all times of the day, every day, get driven right into our social media feeds on Facebook and Instagram, on all the news channels, on our laptops. And all of a sudden, not only are we comparing ourselves to the highlight reel of everyone else, we're trying to process tragedies that are happening all across the world daily. That massive amount of information becomes overwhelming and it can leave you and I feeling anxious. Now, as we continue forward, I want to ask a favor of you. I want to ask, is it okay for me to be a real 
person. Like I'm a pastor and I love Jesus passionately, but I am a real person. And if you're watching our line or ever showed up at South Point and expect me to be something other than a real person, uh, you're probably going to be disappointed. Back in January, we did a series called Five Words That Can Change Your Life. In week two of that series, the word was help. And in that series, I admitted to everyone that last summer I went to see a counselor for a season in my life. And the reason I went to go see a counselor in the summer is because last February, last January, I hit a wall. Now, I've had a lot of tough things happen in my life. I mean, my mom died when I was young. My wife and I had a miscarriage. I mean, I've dealt with some tough things in my life. But last February or March, I found myself in the office after everyone had left. And I had, had my hands up and my head in my hand just going, I don't think I can do this anymore. It seemed like every area of my life, both personally and professionally, like I was cycling uphill, but I absolutely wasn't going to win except for my relationship with Jesus. All the issues and problems I was facing, I felt like I was incapable of solving them. And not only was I incapable of solving them, that I would probably fail with whatever solutions I came up with. I was able to make it through the encouragement of some really good and close friends. And it leads us to a truth this morning is that any of us can get stuck staying anxious. And here's our opening truth. If you're following along in the insert, it says staying anxious can become a prison of what ifs that causes unwise choices. When you and I imagine a threat and the tidal waves of what if come in, we can lock ourselves in a prison. I mean, here's the problem with staying anxious is that we make choices that are flawed because our view isn't clear. We have a view of ourselves and a view of the world that might not be totally True. I mean, think about some of the decisions you were making. Have you ever dated him or her, but because you were worried that you were going to lose them, you compromised your morals and it ended up in a worse situation? Maybe it was in your job or in an academic setting. You were afraid of failure or not making the grade. And so you kind of bent the rules only to create a worse problem. How many of us, because we were afraid our friends wouldn't like us or wouldn't think we were funny and we did something we shouldn't have done and we paid the price? If you and I were honest this morning, I bet many of our worst decisions were based on worry and fear. And it leaves you and I asking one of life's most important questions today. How do you and I not let anxiety cause us to make unwise decisions? And this is where the good news comes in this morning. You, me, we, we are not alone. Did you know that anxiety is an issue that all of humanity has had to deal with all throughout all of history? God knew this would be an issue that we struggle with. Matter of fact, the Bible regularly addresses worry and fear and anxiety. And so today we're going to look at a passage. And this passage that we're going to look at today will kind of be the core passage that carries us throughout the next several weeks. Now I want to tell you a little bit about this passage. It was written by a guy named the Apostle Paul. Now Paul didn't used to follow Jesus. He actually persecuted the church until he encountered a risen Christ. And then he went around and told people about Jesus and created churches. And then he would write them letters. And he wrote this letter to a church from being in Rome. And in Rome, you need to understand, he was in prison and potentially facing the death penalty. And we discover his words, and we're going to put it up on the screen, Philippians 4, 4 through 8, and he says this, listen, rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice, let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Now this seems a little bit crazy. I mean, Paul is under guard in Rome, and he could lose his life, yet he says he's going to rejoice, and he's going to be gentle. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because God is near. And I just want to remind us today that when you and I feel anxious, when you and I worry, we need to remember that God is near. We have a little saying at South Point, it goes like this. If anyone would die for you, they are for you. And he goes on to say this. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situ situation by prayer and petition. Now, it seems a little bit crazy to go, don't be anxious about anything. I mean, especially coming from a guy who's in prison who might lose his life. And sometimes I go, listen, I don't know if I make it through some days without being anxious about some things. And he's not saying you can't have the feeling of anxious. Greek grammar and Western English grammar are different. This phrase is in the present tense, which means don't stay anxious. 
And then he tells us how not to stay anxious. He says, but in every situation through prayer and with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You see, the apostle Paul tells us we have to guard our hearts and our minds because he knows something, that when we stay anxious, we'll have a flawed view. And when we have a flawed view, we make unwise choices that actually hurt the kind of life we want. So here's a guy in prison facing the death penalty who tells us three things. First of all, he tells us that God is with us and that God is for us. Secondly, he tells us that staying anxious is not helpful, it's actually harmful. And then lastly, he tells us the vaccine to anxiety is talking to God, prayer, and gratitude when we thank God for the things that we do. That will protect us from the disease of anxiety. And so this morning, in this chaotic situation, I want to make three observations that will hopefully help all of us, myself, you, and we, deal with anxiety that all of us will face. And so here's observation number one this morning. We're going to put it on the screen. Anxiety is meant to be a signal, not a constant state of being. You know, you see, anxiety isn't supposed to be a state of being. It's a normal emotion. Unfortunately, in church world, often you'll hear this phrase, well, that if you're anxious, then you don't have faith in God. And that's not necessarily true. Anxiety isn't a sin. Actually, feeling anxious is absolutely human and normal. It's a part of the human experience. However, constant anxiety and extreme anxiety aren't good for us. They can actually be unhealthy. And you know this, and I know this. But just like our body can get ill, we can get the flu, we can um, have insulin problems, we can fall and break a bone and then go get help. For some of us, our brains can get ill, and we should absolutely go get help. And taking medicine or seeking help isn't a lack of faith, it is wisdom. True story, about eight months ago, my wife and I bought a used car for my daughter. And we bought this used car in Virginia. And um, this car that we bought in Virginia um, was kind of a, a newer car. And um, we bought it on a day where it was really rainy, it was really cloudy. And we were coming back from Virginia, Virginia across the Woodrow Wilson um, Bridge. And this new car, right? We just paid for it. We just signed the papers, right? And all of a sudden, in the middle of the dashboard where the speedometer is, this blinking light comes on. It starts flashing. And then I did something that, listen, none of you guys should do this, right? But in the middle of the pouring rain where you can barely see, I have my knee on the steering wheel. I'm reaching for the glove box because I'm trying to get to the manual because I don't know if my engine's going to blow up. I don't know if I'm going to ruin a rim. I just bought this car and I don't want to have driven off the lot and ruined this car. So after I crossed the bridge, I got off on the side of the road and took a minute and went to the manual and discovered that the signal flashing was a signal saying that you have a flat tire. Well, I got out of the car and I went through all four wheels and none of them were flat. So I set my watch and I waited a few minutes and then I went back out and looked at the tires and none of them were flat. And the light was still on. And so I waited a few more minutes. None of the tires were flat. So I drove all the way home with this blaring signal being the primary thing, making me feel anxious. But none of my tires were flat. I took it to the auto mechanic and they said, listen, it's a faulty sensor. And your tires are good, but it keeps sending you a signal that something's wrong. Anxiety is not meant to be a state of being. It's meant to be a signal to let us know that something is wrong. Well, what is anxiety a signal of then? Which leads me directly into observation number two, which is this, which is staying anxious is a signal that we feel alone. I bet that all of us have experienced this, that when we begin to worry, when we begin to fret, when we begin to fear, when we begin to feel anxious, we start to, things like, start to think things like this. Nobody sees me. Nobody really understands Nobody knows what it is that I'm going through and no one even notices, does anyone even care? And so if we're really honest, anxiety is a signal that we often feel alone. We feel disconnected and uncared for is what typically anxiety is a signal for. It's basically saying we feel isolated and alone. But that's not always true. Listen, there was a person who once said, feelings 
aren't dictators, they're indicators. And you know this as an adult, and I know this as an adult. Feelings are real, but feelings aren't always true. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. My daughter and I were going to a venue down in D.C. a couple years ago. Um, And as we were driving through D.C., I didn't know where we were going. um, But we had my phone out with the GPS signal. And it got us most way there. We were probably five minutes out from our venue. And we had just taken an exit on into the D.C. area. And then all of a sudden, we lost the signal. And I got very anxious in that moment. I was like, ah, is my phone broken? Did a satellite fall from the sky? Did the cell carrier go bankrupt? And I was freaking out. And then about two seconds later, when we got out of the dead spot, it came back, it showed us where we were, and we got absolutely to where we were supposed to go. And here's what I discovered in that moment. The satellites that give us the GPS signal didn't fall from the sky. The cell carrier didn't go bankrupt. It wasn't a conspiracy of my phone company to, to like mess me up on that trip. There was simply a signal that got interrupted that made me feel disconnected. And if I'm really honest, that's exactly what anxiety does. It's a signal that interrupts us and it makes us feel like we're alone, even though we might not be alone, that there's a God who is near and for us. Which leads us directly into observation number three, which is this, staying anxious is a signal that we need encouragement, that we need encouragement. Just like anxiety can make us feel isolated, anxiety can also make us feel incapable. Sometimes there are circumstances like what's going on in the world right now where we feel like whatever it is that we want to do, wish we could do, or are meant to do is hindered or we're unable or incapable of doing that because of circumstances. And then sometimes it's not circumstances. Sometimes it's our capacity or our capabilities. We go, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I won't be able to make it. And anxiety is a signal that for some reason we think we're incapable of doing something that we were meant to do. And here's the truth I've discovered, discovered, is that we're always capable of more than we think we can, especially when God is with us. One of my hobbies is powerlifting. And it's funny because people always go, powerlifting, are you sure? Like, aren't those usually big, strong people? And I go, yes, I still like powerlifting. I'm just not good at it. But in my research about powerlifting, I discovered something in a scientific journal. Matter of fact, they've done multiple tests on endurance athletes and on strength athletes. And did you know that verbal encouragement saying, you can do it, you can, you can do this, you got this, you go, you're stronger than you think, actually increased strength performance and in, in, um, endurance performance. And that's because that you and I, our souls are fed by encouragement. And so one of the things that we need to realize is that anxiety is a signal that we need some encouragement, that maybe we need to spend some time with God to hear that he is for us. Maybe we need to spend some time with a close friend who says, listen, you got this, you're able, you can make this happen. If I was going to sum up just this first week as we introduced this series called Anxious for Nothing, I would kind of sum it up this way. Anxiety is meant to be an indicator to engage God, not a dictator that rules our responses. I like what the artist Lecrae said. He says this, anxiety is a bat signal to pray to God. How cool is that? Listen, anxiety isn't supposed to dictate poor responses. We don't wanna let anxiety create a flawed view that causes us to make choices that aren't helpful and actually may harm our future. No, no, it's a signal to engage God and to engage others. I think that's really cool. Hey, I want to close with a true story that happened to me just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was sitting in my office and I was on social media and I had a family member post something on social media. It was a little bit cryptic and I I know this family member struggles with social anxiety. And so I said, hey, this would probably be a good time for me to call them. So I called up my my family member on the phone and said, hey, what's going on? And on the other end was a very hectic, um, upset family member. And I said, hey, what's going on? They said, well, uh, yesterday's work, a couple things happened. They didn't go right. They didn't go bad. They didn't go well. And, and um, it was just bad. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, we all have tough days at work. And they said, I didn't sleep last night. I'm supposed to go to work this afternoon. I don't think I can do it. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to be bad at my job. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You didn't sleep last night? And they said, no. I said, well, that, that's never good. You, you can't perform well. I said, here's what do you do. Why don't you just call in sick? The, the employees know that you're a good person. Why don't you just call and say, hey, I can't make it in today, but I'll make it up. Why don't you get a good night's sleep so that you can make healthy decisions and then let's talk tomorrow. 
And they said, well, that sounds like a good plan. So the next day I called this family member back up and said, hey, by the way, as I was thinking about your situation, um, I remembered your tax returns are coming in and you have this other thing and you're not going to lose your job. You won't lose your house. You won't lose the education, continuing education that you're taking to do this job that you want to do. And they were like, oh my gosh, I never thought about it that way. And I was like, yes, you know what? You got a good night's sleep. You have a different point of view. You now see things clear. And they kind of came out of that place where they were staying anxious and almost made some really poor choices. Because anxiety is never meant to be a state of being. It's meant to be a signal that drives us to God and to others. And that's why at South Point we value small groups so much. So here's my challenge to all of us today, to myself, to you, to all of us is that every day this next coming week, that we take one time, just a couple of minutes where we get alone by ourselves, just one time a day that we would sit and talk to God. And we would do that daily. And then here's the second thing, is that you would reach out to a friend. You can reach out to them through text. You can talk to them on phone. You can Facebook them. Maybe go on a walk if you have some free time outside. But just be with someone that can encourage you, and you can be an encouragement to them. Because none of us was meant to do life alone. And through this series, our hope is that we will be anxious for nothing and know that there's a God who is for us and a God who is with us. Let's pray. Hey, God. Thank you that you are near and that you are not far. Thank you that, God, you came and experienced all the bro brokenness and chaos that we experience. God, thank you that you love us. God, thank you that you died on the cross for us. God, thank you that you were true in your words, that Jesus said, in this world we will have trouble, but you have overcome the world. The tomb is empty, and we can put our hope and our trust in you, God. So, God, we look forward to all that you're going to do in our lives this week. We look to you. Help us to not forget, to not only look look towards you, but to love our neighbor. This is our hope and prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.